Did the Bible rip off its cosmology from the ancient Near East? party people the place to be i go by the name of the bk apologies transmitting all the way live new york is the city brooklyn is the borough what's good what's popping hope everybody's doing well on this wednesday evening of course we gotta say what's up to the party people in the chat we got mr unknown in the building we got bodega lady d new we got wawo in the building we got black atheists in the building we got the real american mr phil fox in the building and as always, ladies and gentlemen, if you can, if you have not already, like, share, and subscribe. Please share the link. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend that it's him again. And if you are so inclined and you've been edified or encouraged or even entertained <laughs> by uh, this platform, please, please, by all means, please um, support us via PayPal. And in fact, you know, Tomorrow ha just happens to be my my half a hundred birthday. I hit the big five all tomorrow. So if you'd like to encourage your boy, you know, you could definitely head up to PayPal, which the link is pinned at the chat on top of the chat. Uh, if you'd like to be a monthly supporter of BK, you can hit me on Patreon where you get an assortment of study aids to enhance your personal Bible study. So with that being said, I am once again honored and blessed to have one of the one of the shooters of the UA in the building. Of course, I'm talking about none other than M. J. Jackson. What's going on, sir? <clears throat> well, it's been a, a crazy day, but you know God is still faithful, and I'm. Uh, is, is my mic still clipping? No, you sound better now. Okay, uh, just happy to be here to do more violence. You know. <laughs> well, I believe that when uh, Paul wrote, you know, that we take arguments captive and we tear down strong. I think that he had YouTube in mind. <laughs> I, I think that he did. <laughs> hey, right. The highways and byways. And for us, that means the interwebs. Right. So yep. very true. And thank you for all the positive feedback from the last few shows that me and MJ has done. Um you know, it seems like people have definitely been edified and equipped to to really deal with, you know, uh, defending the gospel and exposing, you know, heresies and false doctrines that come and attack the gospel of Jesus. So I'm glad that everybody, you know, is enjoying it. And we're going to continue uh, in the violence. Uh, you know, we like to pick apart everything. You know, one, again, the one major accusation that people make in, in the conscious community or, you know, the atheist community is, you know, the Bible is a ripoff of fill in the blank, right? And we've discussed, you know, uh, the the copycat myth, right, of Jesus is from Osiris or Jesus is from Horus, you know? And we've also been touching back on where do they get these ideas from in the first place? And we've been dipping into the Corpus Hermeticum and Rosicrucianism and how a lot of these things inform the conscious community's talking points right so we're going to continue in that in that same vein and we're going to talk about how another accusation is that part of the copycat syndrome is that we have plagiarized or ripped off our creation story our, the cosmology of the bible so before we get into that mj if you could give us some of your preliminary thoughts before we dive in on that <clears throat> Well, yeah, like you just said, this is the um, the principal accusation uh, coming from the conscious community and the subset of the conscious community, committed community. Um, they think this is the go-to argument. I, this argument, in my opinion, uh, was spawned uh, in the African American community uh, by the out of the out of Africa. Uh, the out of Africa theory uh, propagated by um, George G.M. James. And of course, Alfredo pretty much told you where he got his teachings from. 
teachings of the lodge and we've already told you where the lodge got most of the, most of their stuff from um <laughs> a fictional novel so uh once again i think the motivation behind this is of course as uh dr carl ellis put in his book free at last that African Americans, in a certain sense, had been sold a bill of goods by Eurocentrism, right? Mm. Whitewashing everything. So the reaction was to blackwash everything. And this fictional novel, propagated by most of the folks within the lodge, gave them the means to do it. And you you hear John Hero Clark call some of these guys neglected scholarship neglected scholarship but let's take a look R radical white scholars radical white <laughs> truth-telling scholars <laughs> so and and like always though right we like to look at the origin of the critique you know uh specifically for today you know that these other um countries and cultures within the ancient near east um were the ghost writers of the creation <clears throat> of the creation account of Genesis, you know. So where does that come from? Who was one of the first persons to make this claim that these other creation stories are, you know, older than the Genesis creation story and therefore superior? Like who who kind of lit the lit the torch for that? Right. We're gonna look at that before we even get into the the compare and contrast. All right. So. This is from Babel and Bible and Bias by Bill T. Arnold and David B. Weisberg. It says, Bible scholars don't often become famous, and they certainly don't do it overnight. But that's what Frederick Del Delzich did 100 years ago. Already known among scholars as a leading Semiticist and historian, Delzich had published the Standard Dictionary of Akkadian a grammar of Akkadian and a book on the Babylonian creation myths. But on January 13th, <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> 1902, amid the dazzling surroundings of Berlin's famed music academy, the 51-year-old German scholar gave a lecture on Babylonia and the Bible that was so controversial, the speaker became an overnight sensation. His impressive audience included not only the German intelligentsia, blah, but also the German emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm II, was so impressed with Dulwich's lecture that he invited him to repeat it for the empress two weeks later at the royal palace. The lecture had been hyped as a landmark event in which Dulwich would shed new light on the Hebrew scriptures using recent spectacular discoveries from excavations in Babylonia, including the law code of King Hammurabi, which has been discovered only the previous year. Delich turned the tables on his audience, however, instead of calling his lecture the Bible in Babylonia, he called it Babylonia and the Bible, right? In German, Babel und Bibel, thereby giving preeminence to Babylonia over the Bible. His thesis was even more shocking. Babylonian religion and culture were not only older than that of the Israelites, but superior too. In the 20th century, Delich lectures come under close scrutiny, and most of what he argued must, in the opinion of virtually all scholars, be discarded. But at the center, centennial of Delich's first lecture, it is still valuable to revisit his lectures and debate they caused in order to illustrate how biases and preconceived convictions sometimes affect the conclusions of Bible scholars. In retrospect, it is easy to identify the extreme German nationalism and anti-Semitism <clears throat> that informed the Delich lectures. And this is a quote from the lecture from him, from, from Delich. He says, instead of immersing ourselves in the rule of God among our own people from Germany's primitive times to the present, we continue granting a revelation status to those old Israelite oracles. Sounds a little salty. Either out of ignorance apathy or blindness but this is no but this no longer stands up to the light of science nor that of religion nor ethics in this way nationalism merged with anti-semitism delich anticipated by only a decade or so 
those German Christians of the Third Reich who sought to eradicate all things Jewish. So he had not only a bias, but he had an agenda, right? The reason why he wanted to show that the Babylonian religion was vastly more ancient and therefore more superior because he wanted to take the, 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 the legs off of this Semitic belief system because he was against the Jews, right? So this idea of that this is better or superior or this comes from the Babylonian theology, well, the reason why he was teaching that, because he had an agenda, he wanted to take away the power that the Old Testament had within his own people. So I'm going to actually, let, I know th I just spring this on you. I just put this, these slides up just now, MJ, but what, what's your reaction to this? Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't know how many uh, commentary heads that we uh, have out there in the audience, but the leech is the famous Delich from the Kyle and Delich Old Testament commentary sets. And um, I can't think of the name Kittle. Okay, also you got Kittle, uh, who has a theological uh, dictionary of the New Testament, those blue dictionaries. A lot of these guys were anti-Semitic. <laughs> right. And some of their stuff is good, Right, let's just keep it real. Some of this stuff was pretty good sure. at the time, but here we, we, we get a chance to see how their anti Semitism is affecting uh, their work, and that's just something to be aware of. You, you, I mean, if you gotta, if you have an axe to grind, it's gonna show, and it's showing. And you know, I got some of their stuff on my shelf. Uh, the leech, his. I'm trying to get rid of his commentary sets because they're just old at this <laughs> point. But yeah, these dudes had an extra grind. No, absolutely. So again, it's always good to look at the origins of these critiques. You know, he was one of the first most popular person to bring forth this idea of these other ancient Near East, you know, creation and theologies were superior to the Bible. And we hear that echoed by people in the conscious community today. And I don't know if they knew who they were echoing. Somebody who was an anti-Semitic, who was trying to like, you know, basically get rid of the popularity of the Old Testament. So, but even though he had a bias and even though he had an agenda, was he correct? Right? Because just because you're biased doesn't mean you're incorrect. Right. So what we're going to look at today, we're going to look at we're going to compare and contrast, you know, the various creation stories. And let's see if the Bible did, quote unquote, rip off not only from Kemet, which we'll definitely be addressing today, but the ancient Near East in general. All right. So with that being said, one of the first things we're going to look at is the Amuna Elish. Right. This is one of the first things that were was it the 19th century when this was discovered, MJ? Was that 18th century? I'm not sure. It could be the 19th. All right. So. I could be wrong. And this is from the polemic nature of the Genesis cosmology by Gerhard F. Hazel. He says, the Babylonian national epic, Imuna Elish, which was not composed to tell the story of creation, but to glorify the god Murduk and the city of Babylon, opens by stating that at first nothing exi existed except the two personified principles, Apsu and Tiamat, the, prim the primeval sweet wet water and salt water oceans, respectively. The Babylonians could thus conceive of a time when there was neither heaven nor earth, only primordial waters, but apparently they could not conceive of a time when there was nothing whatever except a transcendental day. After an elaborate theogony in which the gods evolved from these two personified principles and after Apsu has been subdued by Ea, we find Tiamat resigning, unsubdued, opposed by and suppressing the gods she has begotten. At least one of them, Murdoch, becomes their champion, engages Tiamat in combat and slays her. The concept of the personified Tiamat 
the mythical antagonist of the creator god Murdoch, is completely absent in the notion of Tehom and the Hebrew creation account. In Genesis 1, Tehom is clearly inanimate, a part of the cosmos, not the foe of God, but simply one section of the created world. It does not offer any resistance to God's creative activity. It is therefore unsustainable to speak of a demyth demythicizing, man, I can't talk today, of a Babylonian mythical concept or the use of a mythical name in Genesis 1, uh, 2, um, 37, to suggest that there is in Genesis 1, 2, the remnant of a latent conflict between a chaos monster and a creator god is to read into it from mythology. To the contrary, the author of the Hebrew creation account uses the term Tehom in a deep personalized and non-mythical sense. Tehom is nothing else but a passive, powerless, inanimate element in God's creation. Right? In their Munalish and in various other ancient Near East creation myths, what you will have is this god slash hero fighting against the watery god of chaos. In this case is, is Tiamat. You know, in, in another place in ancient Near East, it was um, Yam, right? And they would destroy the water god of chaos, split the god in half, and that's how they would create the world. MJ, do we see any kind of mono a mono combat with Yahweh and a chaos monster in the Genesis account? Not at all. Not, Not at all. all. <laughs> you, you see God who is sovereign and in large and in charge. <laughs> right doing what, right what god wants to do <laughs> no Absolutely. nobody's on god's level for for chaos matter of fact when when the bible speaks of an enemy it's the enemy of our souls <laughs> not not of god but uh but no there there's absolutely no conflict um in the in the genesis um in, in the opening of Genesis, sorry, it's just not there. So, but, you know, right. we got we got to be mindful of these differences, even though we want to, even not not we, but even though some want to make it as similar as possible. How do you account for these major differences? Yeah, these, and, the, and these are major differences yeah. because, yeah, bro. Well, I'm just saying these are these are not accidental differences. These are essential differences. Right. Because in these other eight ancient Near Eastern accounts, water is personified as an imposing deity. Whereas in Genesis, water is just a element that's been created by God. There's no fighting the water. There's no splitting the water in half. It's God's spirit hovering over the water, mm -hmm. telling the water where to go. <laughs> as, as, as MJ said, completely sovereign, completely in control. Nowhere near close to what these other ancient Near East creation accounts depict right so let's let's keep going there mm -hmm. is the baal anif cycle right um in the baal anif cycle anif the sister of baal speaks in one text about the primordial enemies of baal when what enemy rises up against baal what adversary against whom who mounteth the clouds have i not slain c yam beloved of el have i not annihilated river nahar the great God, have I not muzzled the dragon, Tenon, holding her in a muzzle? I have slain the crooked serpent, Leviathan, the foul fang with seven heads. And again, and this is how disrespectful the Hebrew is, right? In, in, in Mesopotamia, right, the word Yam is the name of a sea god of chaos. But in Hebrew, Yam just means water. Period. There's no deification of water in the in the Hebrew rendering of the word yam. So just in their lexicon, it's already a polemic. Right? Um, the choice of the term tannin in connection with the term bara, emphasizing God's effortless creation of the large aquatic creatures appears as deliberate as a deliberate attempt to contradict the notion of creation in terms of a struggle as contained in the pagan battle myths. It appears inescapable to recognize here again a conscious polemic against the battle. So to MJ's point, what we see in Genesis is not just a telling of how God created the world, but 
he's throwing shots at the opposing creation stories surrounding Israel. Right. You know, in hip hop, it's it's a diss track. You know, like this is how it's done. Oh, and by the way, all these other dudes around me, they for gazing, they whack. Because they had to fight somebody. It's like, I don't fight nobody. I'm Yahweh. I do what I want. You know, so it, it's written specifically as a, a giving of, of, of how the world was created by Yahweh. But also, it's shots are being thrown left and right by Yahweh. What do you think, MJ? <laughs> a good book for everybody to check out. You know, I, I'm I always recommend you something to read. And, and the sources that we're referencing are actually found in a lot of these books. But this one right here. That's a good book. Against like the that. Gods That's uh, by John, by Dr. John D. Curate, right? And in this book, it talks about how the biblical writers engage in subversion or polemics. Okay, which yes, obviously, obviously, it uh, demonstrates their familiarity with some of the myths around them. But we also get to see how the biblical writers go to great lengths to to really take shots, to crack jokes, to high side, to do, to do all kinds of things with these uh, inferior beings. Uh, if you want to call them that, these inferior Elohim, right? Uh, th once again, they're they're re so, so we see the the Genesis uh, one, right? And the first principle in Genesis one is not matter; it's not water, because what you see in Genesis one is that God's spirit is distinct from the water. Theologians would call that I say. Or aseity, so God possess, uh, possesses uh, self sufficiency, uh, sufficient within uh, God's self. So you 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 see the first principle is spirit, not water, not matter, as we'll see in other uh, in in other. But the first principle is spirit, and there is no contention when God wants to create. God creates. <laughs> right. So don't need help at all. Don't need help. So we see the biblical writers, and if you think that this was edited by a group of folks, whatever you think, we see their knowledge of uh, various belief systems around them, and we see them going out of their way to take shots at these inferior belief systems because, uh, philosophically speaking, they're they're inferior as well. We can also. We'll also point out a few things with that philosophically tonight as well. Right. And as, as a side note, you know, you know, we defend the faith, right? That's that's the whole concept of apologetics. But we also do polemics as well. Right? It's not just defense. We go on the offensive as well. And we can do that because the Bible does it. The Bible goes on the offensive and targets these other belief system and shoots them down on a regular basis. Like once you understand the cultural context behind a lot of these events in the Bible, you're going to see a lot of shots being thrown, like a lot, like the Draco with unlimited clips. Just rah, it's it's crazy. You know, do a study of, Ex of Exodus 15, the song of the sea. That whole joint is like Tupac hit him up. Like it's crazy. It's crazy. So now we're going to look at some of the comedic creation accounts. And yes, accounts. There's more than one. So when people say, you're ripping off from, you know, comedic spirituality, a good question to ask is, like, well, which one? Because there's at least three major ones, right? And one of those is the Heliopolitan theology. And in this theology, it says, in Heliopolitan theology, none, the pre-existent primeval ocean, which is an oxymoron, right? Pre-existent <laughs> ocean. Came into being by himself, okay? In one of the Egyptian cosmogonic speculations, Atum, who arose out of the pre-existent Nun, threatened that the land will return into Nun, into the floodwaters, as in its first state. Thus, it is to be noted that in the Heliopolitan cosmogonic mythology, 
the watery chaos or waste was pre-existent and was personified as Nun, the mother of gods, or she who bears Ray, the sun god, identified with Atum each day. Okay, so this this primordial water is itself a god, right? The the waters of Nun, and it came into being by himself. It's self-created. Keep that in mind. Next is Menphite theology. Okay, and the rival Menphite theology, Pata. The chief god of Memphis is equated with Nun and is the creative principle itself out of which Atum and all other gods were created. So Ptah is both Nun, the primeval ocean, and the Tatanin, the primeval land which rose out of Nun and is equated with the land of Egypt. Okay, again, another created being. Then we go to Hermopolitan cosmogony. In this cosmogony, there existed prior to creation an infinite, dark, watery chaos, whose characteristics are incorporated into the four pairs of gods of the old Da'ad. As the water begins to stir, the primeval hillock emerges from the deep, bringing up the cosmic egg out of which Ray, the sun god, will appear to proceed with the creation of all other things. The new creative events occur in cyclical fashion with the daily rebirth of the sun and the annual receding of the Nile. Now, what do these theologies have in common? They all depict a theogony, right? In the Greek English lexicon, the, the, a, the, a theogony is the ge genealogy of, or birth of the gods. Quick question, MJ. Is there, a the, is there a theogony in the Genesis account? Heck no. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm going to say heck because, uh, you know. Right, it's a family show. It's a family yeah, show. Right, family right, right. Show. But you know what I want to I want to do like Martin Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, sir. There no, is no. Please. Right. There's no birth of Yahweh. That's a, that, that's a contradiction with his name <laughs> for, for Christ's sakes. That Nate says language, MJ. Yes. <laughs> All right. So in um, this is from Nahum M. Sana creation from Genesis. He says <clears throat> the traditional English translation reads in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This rendering construes the verse as an independent sentence complete in itself, a solemn declaration that serves as an appetizing caption to the entire narrative. It takes the initial world better sheet to mean at the beginning of time and thus makes a momentous assertion about the nature of God, that he is wholly outside of time, just as he is outside of space, both of which he proceeds to create. In other words, for the first time in the religious history of the Near East, God is conceived as a being entirely free of temporal and spatial dimensions. That's huge. That's a huge departure from the comedic creation stories. Because even though they have different names, it's basically the same story, right? They come from this watery abyss, right? And, and in one in one theology in Kemet, the watery abyss itself is a guy, a self-created guy. So you tell me what's more powerful, a God that emerges from the water or a God that made the water in the first place? I'm saying, I'm saying it's a big difference. A big difference. All and these I, Pata, Atun, they're all contingent beings. Mm -hmm. They're There's made stuff. of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yahweh's not made of anything. Yeah, MJ. No, nah, you just you just hit the nail on the head. They're contingent, right? They're contingent. In several passages in the Bible. You know, you 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 have uh, passages in Isaiah where it says that God inhabits eternity. Um, you you have that um, that Jesus would be called uh, the the Father of eternity, as some translations put it. You know, everlasting Father, Father of eternity, things like that. But the bottom line is what we're getting at. One is philosophically. Uh, it's dysfunctional to say 
that something can create itself. Because the metaphysical principle is this, from nothing, nothing can come. <laughs> okay? None of these guys are self-existent. But you have in certain comedic, um, certain comedic uh, traditions where the God brings himself into existence. Well, how can you bring yourself into existence when you don't exist? And then you want to look at the Christian and say, well, you got stole, you ripped it. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. And that's, that's one, when we test the worldview, right? And I talked to Adam uh, on, on his, on his uh, show about uh, the test of a worldview, right? You have the test of reason, all right? And the test of reason is, okay, um, is, is your worldview philosophically coherent? Right. Um, are there contradictions in your worldview? In one contradiction for the uh, for all of them, right, that we're seeing is uh, the violation of the law of non-contradiction. Right? Because you cannot bring yourself into existence if you don't exist. You could try to say that, oh, this is beyond... Um, this is beyond us, man. It's, it's a myth. You got to use your imagination. I'm sorry. It's just not true. Things don't pop into existence. They, they, you know, they, they just don't. Right. No. So right then and there, you have several red flags being raised up, let alone when you try to say that the, that the, the Hebrew Bible is a copy of this. No, <laughs> no, it, it 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 just doesn't add up. It won't wash. No, right. And, and not only is it not a copy, it displays the uniqueness of the Genesis account because throughout the ancient Near East, every account has a self-created deity or a deity that arises from the watery abyss. Yahweh is the only God that's always been here. There is no theogony. There is no creation story of God. Big, big difference, right? So the next thing we're going to look at is how do these theologies, these cosmologies, deal with the concept of heaven and earth, right? The Sumerians present the process of separation as the sundering of heaven from earth by the air god Enlil, right? The Babylonian epic, Imuna Elish, reports that Murdoch forms heaven out of the upper part of a slain Tiamat and earth out of the lower part of the deep from her blood. So the earth and the, the world as we know it was made from a severed beast that Murdoch killed. That's how the world, that's how heaven and earth gets created, right? The Hittite version of a Hurrian myth visualizes the process of separating heaven and earth as being performed with a cutting tool, okay? In Phoenician mythology, separation is described as splitting of the, as the splitting of the world egg, okay? So you, there's, there's vast differences in how heaven and earth is constructed here, right? In Egyptian cosmogony, one finds that Shu, the air god, pushed up Nut, the sky goddess from Geb, the earth god with whom she was embraced. This forced separation brings about heaven and earth. All right. So the picture in Genesis 1 6 has its analogy, if has its analogy to pagan mythology, in that it also describes the creation of heaven and earth to be an act of separation. However, notable distinctions appear as soon as one inquires into the how of the act of separation. In contrast to Babylonian and Egyptian mythology, the firmament is raised simply by the fiat of God without any struggle, whatever. The waters in Genesis 1 are completely powerless, inanimate, and inert. The firmament sky is fashioned by separating the waters on a horizontal level with waters above and below the firmament. And in the second step, the waters below the firmament are separated on a vertical level to let the dry land appear separated from the waters. Any notion of a combat, struggle, or force is absent in both of these creative acts. 
God doesn't have to like rip apart an animal or use some sort of tool, right? He doesn't have to cut an egg in half. He doesn't need to do any of that. It just happens because it's his will, period. So again, show me where the Bible's ripping off from these from these mythologies. I don't understand. MJ? He doesn't have to masturbate. <laughs> you know. <sighs> and he's not being vulgar. That's that he's actually citing a creation account. I'm, I'm citing a creation. I'm not being vulgar, guys. I'm not being vulgar. This is what these guys thought that either you got to use violence or you got to use sex to get something done. Oh, that's a good point. That's what they thought. That's a good point. Sex and violence. Sex and violence. So here what we are seeing is not only the aseity of God on full display, but the holiness of God in contrast to these pagans. <laughs> and I'm going to use that word to these pagans. Sure. So we're seeing the holiness of God revealed through his act of creation. And it's just not, it's just dishonest with the data to, 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 to keep pushing that it was copied. You really got to do all kinds of mental gymnastics to, to stick to that point. And I'm sorry, it, it just won't stick. Absolutely. So next we're going to look at how these different cosmologies deal with the purpose of the creation of man. Sumerian mythology is incomplete, is in complete accord with the Babylonian Atherhas epic in the Muna Elish, and depicting the need of the creation of man to result from the attempt to relieve the gods from laboring for their sustenance. So in the Babylonian creation stories, man is made specifically and only to service the gods, and that's it. The first chapter of the Bible depicts man as the pinnacle of creation. Man is not made as a kind of afterthought in order to take care of the needs of the gods. He appears as the only one blessed by God. He is the ruler of the animal and vegetable kingdoms. All seed bearing plants and fruit trees are his for food. Notice in the other account, it's the, the, the humans are made to give food to the gods. But the Genesis account, God makes food for man, right? Here, the divine concern and the divine care for man's physical needs comes to expression and antithesis to a man's purpose to care for the physical needs of the gods in the Sumero Akkadian mythology. Big difference. We made you to take care of us. God, I made you because I love you. And I want, and I'm gonna take care of you. I'm giving you, I'm giving you substance. Big difference, right? Um, actually, before we get into that, um, MJ, your thoughts, sir. Yeah, I just wanna I just wanna read a passage from page 69 of the Bible amongst the myth, the Bible amongst the myth. Another great book. But Dr. Great book. Oswald. I, I interviewed him about this book on my channel. If y'all want to go back and look at that, but on page 69. He says, unlike the myth, the Bible shows a high view of humanity. And this, this is directly related to the biblical concept of origins. Instead of, of the gods being made in the image of humanity, with all that seems to mean of determinism, pettiness, and materiality. Okay, so he's saying that the gods of the pagans are petty. They get into squabbles. Yep. They act like children. Sex and violence, once again. Uh, humanity is made in the image of God with all that means freedom, nobility, and personhood. But even when we say that, we must be clear that image, as the Bible uses it, uh, it does not involve some automatic partaking of the stuff of God. We are in his image because of free divine choice. Because of that choice, we have the opportunity to participate with God in the development of earth resources. So once again, we're talking about purpose. 
humanity humanity was not an afterthought in terms of when God decided to choose. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 1, you know, Paul is laying, laying out quite a few things that God had human beings in mind, even, even with them being conformed uh, to the image of Christ, even in terms of election. And we can talk about election. I, you know, we might have a few different views on election, things like mm -hmm. that. But God had humanity in mind when it came to creation and his overall purposes. And we just, once again, we got to talk about this because if you want to talk about, um, if you want to talk about ripoffs and things like that, we got to talk about protology and we got to talk about eschatology. Oh. We got to talk about it. So once again, I, I don't see it. You know, maybe, maybe whoever sees it, they probably got something in their drink or they're smoking something. But once again, I, I don't see the connections that people are trying to say that the Bible is a ripoff of Kemet specifically. Right. Uh, zero zero two one two two says my view on election is Kanye got robbed. <laughs> got jokes, got jokes. So the next thing we're gonna look at is creation by word, right? What do these different cosmologies speak on when when they talk about creating by by words, right? Uh, the Memphite theology of the Egyptian Old Kingdom knows that God or tomb creates by the speech of Ptah. SGF Brandon's investigation of the notion of creation by divine word in Egyptian thought has led him to the conclusion that creation was effected by magical utterance. Quote, thus it seems certain that in Egyptian speculation, the pronouncement of the right magical word, like the performance of the right magical action, actualizes the animate potentialities inherent in matter. All right. So basically, Pata is Doctor Strange with the eye of Agamotto. He has to have this, you know, put his hands a certain way, has to say a certain incantation so that he can affect change in various forms of matter. Right. So that's what Pata has to do. Now, in Genesis 1, on the other hand, the notions of a magical word and of animate potentialities inherent in matter are absent. The first chapter of the Bible knows only of creation by an effortless, omnipotent, and unchallenged divine word, which renders the so-called similarity between the Egyptian magic, magic word and the Hebrew effortless word of Genesis 1 as wholly superficial. Genesis 1 shows in its view of God's creative word its distance to pagan mythology. In Genesis 1, God's effortless creation by the spoken word in the words of H. Ringgren, quote, is given a fundamental significance that is without parallel. So, so God doesn't have to like spit the right words, the right series of words, MJ. He don't have to, you know, by the power of grace, God, he don't got to do all that stuff. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Once again, just like and once again, uh Dr. Oswald points out that the ultimate principle is spirit, right? Not matter, nothing is inherent in matter. Um matter matter is really a uh an afterthought, right? But the ultimate principle is spirit, and once again, you gotta be careful. And I appreciate my, my Calvinist presuppositional brothers for often hammering uh, this point home is what we have here is a creator creature distinction. And as a matter of fact, the Israelites were commanded to uh, stay away from magic because magic was thought to be a form of manipulation of how you mm. can manipulate uh, the deities and matter and all that things. Right. But but you can't manipulate God. Uh, matter of fact, the Bible says that God is the one that speaks those things as uh, that are as though they were uh, as though they were not, and things like that. It's God who does that one. That's a shot at the word of faith, people. But it's, it's God who's able to do that, 
not us. We don't have that ability, but God does. His word is inherently powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's his word, not matter or anything else, but the word of God. Absolutely. And as a bonus, right, when talking about magic, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, when Moses was battling the sorcerers in Kemet, that Moses was also incorporating magic. Well, again, you have to understand what magic is from a comedic perspective. Right. And again, to your to your point, it is a manipulation of a deity to do your will. Was that the case with Moses? No. God is telling Moses what to do. Moses is not telling God, hey, I need this right now. Turn turn this stick to a snake. No, God says, no, this is what I need you to do. So clearly God is in control. He's sovereign. He's telling Moses. It's not the other way around. So by, by that definition, it's, it's not sorcery. He's just obeying his God. Big difference. So. But yeah, that's that's about it, man. That's that's what I want to share with you guys tonight. I uh, hope this was you found this edifying. And um, again, when people make these accusations, go to the primary resources. Go to the go to the Menfi theology. Read it. It's there. It's been translated. The 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 Helopolitan, the Heliopolitan, the Bow cycle. All these things have been translated for the most part. We can read it now and compare it to the, the biblical text to see if this accusation sticks. And as we see tonight, it does not. So, of course, that begs the question, then why do people keep making this accusation? It's because they have an agenda. It's because they have a bias. Right? They, they need the biblical account to be flawed, to be plagiarized. They need it to be that way. Because if it's true, now you got to deal with it. And as they say in battle rap, you know, grown man bars is something you got to deal with. <laughs> All right? You got to deal with God. If God exists and the Bible actually says what it says, you have to deal with that. So people will jump through hoops, squint their eyes, do whatever they can to feel comfortable in their rebellion. In their rebellion. They, they, they want to feel comfortable. So we have to say it's this, it's that, it's, it's plagiarism, it's a copy. It's, you know, they have to. They have to. So, MJ, before, before we're out of here, man, share, share, share your future endeavors and your final thoughts. Well, um, if you guys could keep my wife in your prayers, she's a little bit under the weather. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble putting all her business out there. She'll blast. She'll accuse me of HIPAA violations if I mention too much. So uh, so I'll just ask all you wonderful people to uh, keep her in your prayers. But uh, right now, uh, just getting ready to do a couple of debate reviews. I'll probably roll, I'll probably pre-record it and roll it out on Monday. I think that's the way that I'm going uh, to be reviewing both of uh, Vocab's uh, debates. Um, I'm going to get ready to uh, get back to doing Freestyle Fridays and uh, a few freestyles when we can't go on Fridays, me and Chris Bryan Samuel uh, within our, uh, you know, uh, public theology engagement. That's pretty much what it is. So we'll be doing that. But I uh, started a new semester uh, of school uh, with just six classes to go. And I'll be done with that probably come uh, fall of this year. So keep me uh, prayed up with that. But that's about it. Amen. Amen. So, yes, definitely like, share, and subscribe to um, Machete MJ Jackson. One of the bad boys of the Urban Apologetics crew, you know what I mean? Always looking for for some violence, you know what I mean? So, in in a good sense, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. So with that, with that being said, yes. <laughs> so with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, again, I hope you you found this edifying. I hope it has has equipped you. I hope it, it's it's made you more more sturdy in your faith that you know the the decision that you've made to make Jesus Lord 
is based on facts, logic, and reason, not just feelings. Those feelings are a part of that, right? And you you have every right to be confident in the walk that you have with the God of the Bible. And with that, peace.